How are you? Trust you're having a great time at fellowship this morning, but we're going to come to the time where we worship the Lord together, ask you to gather, find a seat. I've got a few quick announcements for you this morning. Um, there is no junior church again, no junior church for summer, but uh, there is still nursery. So if you've got a child under the age of three and would like some child care, there is child care available in the nursery. Um, a note on junior church and nursery, this fall we will need more helpers. So if the Lord is laying on your heart to serve young children, we need you. If, if he's not laying it on your heart, please contemplate and consider helping out with our children's ministry because we need more helpers. So junior church and nursery will need more helpers this fall. Um, another ministry that we're looking ahead to, so there's no active ministries going on throughout the summer right now, but one we're looking forward to is the ladies' retreat at Muskoka Bible Center, and that's one where... The church itself is putting it on, but uh, Steph is looking for numbers for ladies so that she can properly book the right rooms and the amount of food that we have. So when Steph comes back in a couple of weeks, she'd like to firm up the numbers. So if you want to throw your name in and be a part of that ladies' ministry um, or, or attend the conference, please do so. Um, and then the last announcement I have this morning is we have Mike Woods, who's going to be presenting the Word this morning. Mike Woods uh, helps oversee the Word of Life Bible Institute in Owen Sound. That's the Bible Institute that I went to. It's a great Bible Institute. And uh, Mike uh, is going to be sharing the word, maybe share a little bit of his family background, but uh, will also uh, declare the word for us. But uh, yeah, I'm excited to, to be here with you, and I hope you're excited as well. Let's stand together as we open up our worship th service this morning with a word of prayer. Father God, we thank you again for your goodness to us. We thank you for your love, for your grace, for your mercy. Your, your provision of our breath, our life here on this earth. We thank you for sustaining us. But God, as we come to this time where we sing praises to you and open up your word, we pray that you would be glorified and that you would encourage us through your spirit this morning. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Let's open our worship service this morning with Glorious Day. I was buried beneath my shame Who could carry that kind of weight It was my tomb Till I met you I was breathing but not alive all my failures I tried to hide It was my truth Till I met you You called my name And I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness Into your glorious day called my name and I ran out of that grave out of the darkness into your glorious day now your mercy has saved my soul now you're free is all that I know. The old made new. Jesus, when I met you, you called my name and I ran out of that grave. Out of the darkness into your glorious day. Glorious day. Ah. 
I needed rescue. My sin was heavy, but chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter. I was an orphan. Now you call me a citizen of heaven. When I was broken, you were my healing. Now your love is the air that I'm breathing. I have a future. My eyes are open. Cause when you called my name And I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness Into your glorious day You called my name And I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness Into your glorious day. Beautiful worshiping with you this morning. Trust that song is an encouragement to you. That we can sing our salvation song, our testimony song, that God has called us out of that grave and that our focus is no longer here on this earth. It's for our heavenly home. Our citizenship is in heaven, and the Lord is changing us from the inside out, right? We don't change outside in. Well, we do change outside, don't we, right? Yeah, eventually. But from the inside out, it gets more beautiful and precious in time. We're to let the light out, right? So let's sing this song as a praise and also an encouragement and a challenge for us this morning to focus our attention on who is doing the work within us. It's Christ and Christ alone. Let's sing together from the inside out. A thousand times I fail Still your mercy remains Should I stumble again Still I'm God in your grace Everlasting Your light will shine when all purpose remains the art of losing myself in bringing you praise everlasting your light will shine when all else fades never ending your glory goes beyond all pain my heart and my soul I give you control, consume me from the inside out, Lord. Let justice and praise become my embrace, to love you from the inside out. Everlasting, your light will shine when all else fades, never ends. Your glory goes beyond all things, and the cry of my heart is to bring you praise from the inside out, Lord, my soul. of losing myself in bringing you grace everlasting your light will shine when all else fades never ending your glory goes beyond all things my heart and my soul I give you control consume me from me 
Let justice embrace, become my embrace, to love you from the inside out. Everlasting, your light will shine when all else fades. Never ending, your glory goes beyond all fame, and the cry song we'll sing in preparation for the message this morning is Behold Our God.
Well, good morning, everybody. It's a privilege to be here with you. Um, just going to do something that I don't normally do, but just share something that God kind of put on my heart as we were singing um, that last song about Behold Our God. Uh, we're just kind of a little bit convicted. I, I was able to drive up here this morning, and I was sitting in Tim Hortons um, going over my notes because that's like the super pastoral thing to do. And uh, I, I was just, it's, it's interesting. If you ever sit in Tim Hortons with your Bible open, just like people notice, and they look at you, and they know what the Bible is. And I was just kind of convicted as we were singing that song, Behold Our God, is um, they might know what the Bible is, but I don't think they know what the Bible is about, and they certainly don't know who our God is. And I was just convicted in thinking, you know, um, when was the last time I took that Bible that I'm about to share from and told somebody about the God that's in that Bible. Because I love worshiping him. I love sharing his words. Um, but sometimes I can get kind of a little scared about telling other people about him. And so um, I was just a little bit convicted about that. So I wanted to share that with you. We do um, truly live in a world where um, people might recognize the Bible, but don't know the God that we do worship. And so just wanted to kind of share that. And uh, also just kind of helped me realize that it would be good to know, for people to know who God is before the moment that happens in Philippians chapter 2, where it says in verse 10, so that, the name of the, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God our Father. And so it's part of our responsibility to tell people who that God is before they meet their maker. So anyways, that has nothing to do with anything. I normally never do that, but God has really put that on my heart as I, we were worshiping together. Um, so my, my name is Mike Woods, and I have the privilege of being a missionary on your behalf here in Canada. And so as a family, we greatly su appreciate your support. I work at Word of Life Bible Institute and have the privilege of overseeing the Bible Institute there, which is not where, when, I, when you guys sent me out from here a couple of years ago, not what I had in mind of where God would put me, but uh, that's what God decided to do. And so I'm learning what it means to be a leader. I'm making mistakes, and I am... Um, learning what it means to like do things to glorify God and not fear man in kind of a more sped up way that I had intended to learn. Um, but God is gracious and uh, enjoying that and still have tons and tons to learn. I serve there with my family, uh, my wife Carla, and my two children, Oliver and Logan. And so when we were here, we had Oliver, but Logan's been born since then. And uh, so we just love to serve the Lord there on your behalf. And it's a privilege for us to, to serve and to be part of a ministry that's involved in equipping young people to, to learn the word and to love and to serve God. And the, the real goal of our ministry is to create a program where students can come and learn and just be an environment that's ideal for them to grow in their relationship with God. Because there's, there's so many distractions in this world, and it's really cool to see young people take a year to set aside to, to come and be part of a program that's very, that's literally all, it, I spend a lot, we spend a lot of time praying and working to make a, a program that's designed to create an environment where they can grow to the best of their ability for God's glory and his honor. And so it's awesome to do that together. Um, so I'm going to share this morning, if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Philippians chapter 3. Um, we're going to go through verses 2 to 12 together. And so I don't have the privilege, um, we love that you lent us, maybe you knew this or not, but uh, Josh came and taught um, at the Bible Institute this past year, and it was an absolute blessing um, having a young man come and share God's Word. And Stephanie was able to come, and it was just an encouragement for our family, and specifically for my wife, Carla, so thank you for lending him for that time. Um, but I don't have the privilege of preaching through a book of the Bible, and I'm going to kind of jump in the middle of something and not able to give you all the context I would love to do if I preach through it exegetically. So I'm going to do like an overview of what's happening in this book before we jump into chapter 3. And so Philippians is a letter that Paul wrote. Um, this is a letter that Paul wrote to a church that he helped start on his second missionary journey. And so 
Paul was busy doing ministry. He had the whole Macedonian call thing, and God called him to Europe, and he's ministering in Europe. And some different people you might recognize or know if you've been around the Bible for a while, there was this, name, this, this lady named Lydia who is famous for, like, dying purple clothes, and she gets saved through Paul in uh, Barnabas's ministry. And uh, then additionally, um, they're doing the whole like preaching the word thing, and because of that, some situations arise because the people don't like what they're doing, and they end up in prison, and they're busy worshiping God in jail, which is like crazy for me to think about, but they're worshiping and singing praises to God, and this whole like crazy earthquake thing happens, and the jail cell breaks open, and the jailer's about to kill himself, and Paul and Silas say, um, I said Barnabas before I meant Silas, but Paul, Paul and Silas say, you know, we're, we're, we're here, don't worry, and as a result of that, this jailer comes to, to, to know the Lord, right? And so out of that, this church is born, and uh, it's, just an, it's just this church that Paul has this deep love for, and it happens to be the first church that Paul plants in Europe. And so um, he's busy doing these things, and so in this letter, he's trying to encourage these people um, in a specific way. I think it really um, is something we can relate to and is an important theme that Paul's trying to teach throughout this book. He's trying to teach and encourage the people to, to have encouragement for joy and unity in the midst of affliction. So that's really the theme of Philippians is encouragement for joy and unity in the midst of affliction. And um, I think that is a very important message for, for, I know for me to learn, but for us to learn in general in the, in the world that we live in. I don't know um, how you would describe the last two and a half-ish, three years of our lives, but affliction might be a word that comes to your mind. It hasn't been easy. I mean, in general, life isn't easy, if we're being honest, but the last couple years have been really hard. And if I'm being blunt and, and honest about my own heart, things that I don't seem to experience very much in the midst of, ex, of affliction in my own life is joy and encouragement. If I'm being honest, my, my response normally in the midst of hard times is I'm like bitter and I complain and I'm grumpy. That's kind of how I deal with affliction. But there's, there's a way, and Paul's trying to encourage this Philippian church, there, there's a way to experience joy and encouragement in the midst of affliction. I think that's a great thing for us to learn. And so in the beginning of this letter, Paul lets the church know that he has a very deep love for this church, and he genuinely did. And so Paul is busy being, and at this time he's in prison, and he's convinced that God has him there for a reason. He's, 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 he's witnessing to the imperial guard there, and people within Caesar's house are getting saved, which is, at, which is incredible. And, he, and he, he shares this thing, this truth, that for him to live is Christ and to die is gain. And there's this tension that he explains that he gets going on in his heart and in his life, and he he just doesn't know what's better. Is it better for me to, to stay here on earth and to do what God has designed for, for me and, and to, to, to serve the church? Or is it better for me to, to leave this place and to be with God? Because genuinely, um, who isn't excited for the day they get to meet Jesus face to face, the person that died on the cross for their sins? And so Paul has this, just this burden in his heart to be with the Lord, but knows that God wants him to be here. And so he's challenging the people to live a life worthy of the gospel. And to, and to make Paul's joy complete by living this out in their own lives. And then he encourages them, he shares the example of Christ's humility and encourages the believers in Philippi to be humble followers just like Christ gave an example of and in in, in, through his life. And then he also lets them know that they need to be light in a dark world. And he gives them examples of some people, Timothy and Epaphroditus, who lived that out and that they could see and look. And, the, and Paul was like, try, try to imitate these people and, and be like them, to be this example. Okay, so that's like the super sped up version that leads us all into chapter three. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of context and grasp on where we're going to be. And we're gonna jump into chapter three together, but let me first open in a word of prayer. Um, dear God, I thank you so much for this day, Lord. Uh, God, I just thank you for this time where we can get together. Lord, I thank you for your words. God, I thank you for the good news of the gospel and for sending Jesus Christ to die on the cross for our sins, even though we didn't deserve it. And as we just look at this passage this morning, this morning, God, I pray that you'd be um, honored and glorified through everything that is said. In your precious and holy name I pray, amen. All right, so the, the topic that I want to speak about today is self-confidence. And so I'm going to read this passage together and then explain what I mean by that and then hopefully be able to encourage you through God's word here this morning. So let's read this passage together. 
Starting in verse 2, it says, Look out for the dogs, look out for the evildoers, look out for those who mutilate the flesh of Philippians chapter 3. Sorry, Philippians chapter 3, verse 2. Verse 3 says, for we, for we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also, if anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, but whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ. The righteousness from God that depends on faith that I may know him in the power of his resurrection and may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make, this, to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Okay, so let me explain to you a little bit what I mean by um, talking about self-confidence here. And so I want to define for you what self-confidence is. And so I did this super um, academic thing to find a definition, okay? So what I did is I got Google, and I typed in, what is self-confidence? And then I looked for the first thing that ended in, like, it was a university, okay? So according to, univers to, to Queensland University in Australia, this is what self-confidence and self-esteem mean, okay? So self-esteem refers to whether you appreciate or value yourself, all right? Self-esteem is whether you appreciate or value yourself. Self-confidence is your belief in yourself and your abilities, okay? So here's a little bit of an example to see if you maybe struggle with self-confidence or self-esteem. It says this, if you have low self-esteem or low self-confidence, self you may find that individual negative or disappointing experiences affect how you feel about yourself. This can cause a self-perpetuating cycle of negative thinking where negative expectations for the future discourage you from trying. This leads to disappointing outcomes. For example... If you're lacking self-confidence and you receive low marks for an assignment, you may think, what else could I expect? I'm stupid. This proves it, and I might as well just leave or give up. All right, so that's what it looks like. Self-confidence and self-esteem are something that are talked about a ton in our society. Um, just the importance for you to be able to, to, to feel confident in your own abilities and what you can do, and, what that, and, then, and then the importance of how that plays in your role in society. Really, our, our world teaches that if you can't have confidence in what you do and believe that you're able to do some things, then it's really diff it's going to be very difficult for you to find your place in society and to be, to be useful to adding to the growth of the community that you live in. So self-confidence and um, self-esteem are, are extremely important. But what does self-confidence look like in the context of the gospel and the Bible? And I wanted to start with this explanation of self-confidence because what we can do sometimes as believers is we can believe that there's something that we can do that impacts our relationship with God. We, we believe that there's, there's things that we can do that might impress God. And if we're able to do these certain things, then that is going to make our standing with God be in a right place. And so Paul, Paul's addressing believers here when he's talking about this issue that's going on and what, what, how he defines it or how the Bible calls this. When you believe that there's something that you can do to impact your relationship with God, the Bible calls that self-righteousness. You, you believe that there's something that you can do to have a right standing with God. And so I wanted to start with the topic of self-esteem and self-confidence and explain what that is because we might realize that maybe we struggle with those things, but if I got up here and said, okay, um, I just want to share with you guys something from the words, um, you guys probably all struggle with being self-righteous. 
You'd, <laughs> you'd be like, uh, I do too, right? But you'd be like, oh, okay, wait a second, pastor, preacher, guy. I, I might be a lot of things, but I don't think I'm that great of a person, if I'm being honest. I mean, you know, I, I, don't, I don't think, I, I, there, I don't know if you could call me self-righteous, maybe independent or self-confident, but I don't know about self-righteous, Okay. But I just want to say that there's, there's a lot of things, and Paul's going to explain what that looks like, and we'll give some practical examples later of what it looks like to be self-righteous. And so listen to how Paul describes people that struggle with being self-righteous, okay? In verse 2, okay, we're going to talk about how the Judaizers tried to be self-righteous. So that's point number one, verses 2 to 3. This was tried by the Judaizers. So this is how Paul talks about them. It says, look out for the dogs, look out for the evildoers, look out for those who mutilate the flesh, for we are the circumcision who worship by God and the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. And so the Judaizers were these group of Jewish people who were in the church and they believed there were things that people needed to do above and beyond just placing their faith in God in order to prove that they had a true relationship with God. And so the example of what they're doing here is they believed that people needed to be circumcised on top of placing their faith in Jesus Christ in order to have a genuine relationship in God with God. And the words that Paul uses to describe these people is pretty strong, okay? He calls them Dogs and evildoers. And in our society in North America, okay, when we think of dogs, dogs are kind of like cute and, and cuddly, and we take very good care of them, and we buy health insurance for them, and we take them first, you know, on first-class flights around the world and things. Dogs are like special, and I, I don't, I have nothing against dogs, but um, if you've ever, if you think about dogs in the ancient world, or if you've ever been to a third-world country, and I'm sorry, dog lovers, okay, if you meet a dog on the street okay? They're, they're not very nice. I, I spent a lot of time in South America. I went to school in Argentina. That's where I went my wife. And um, my mom's a dog person. But like dog, uh, like a mangy street dog is like cares about no one, doesn't look very cute, and you don't go near it because it tries to bite you, okay? And it'll fight over every scrap of food. And so that's what Paul has in mind when he thinks of the word dog. He's not thinking of like a cute little poodle. It's like a vicious animal that nobody likes or wants to be around. And then he calls them evildoers. So he has these strong languages for these people that are trying to convince the church that there's something that they can do to impact their relationship with God. He's, he's saying, these people are saying, this is what you need to do in order to prove that you love God. And so Paul is very against this. And I want you to understand sometimes when we hear about these people um, like the Judaizers that were in the church, we can kind of sometimes think of like, like that this is like what their typical day looked like, okay? So there's the Judaizers. They wake up in the morning. They're going to go to church, and they're thinking, how can I destroy this church today? Well, well what could I do to make Paul's life miserable? Because I just want people to hate God. That that's, not, that's what we can kind of think of when we hear about these people. But these are, these are people who, who love Paul, who, who love the church, who wake up and go and serve in this church. They're, they're, just, they're just normal people like you and I that, that attend church and, and care strongly about their church. But they've been deceived a bit into thinking there's something that they need to add that they can do that will impact their relationship with God. And so the Judaizers were trying to do this, and Paul condemns it very clearly. But I want you to know they're, they're just people who are trying to serve God to the best of their ability, but who had been deceived into thinking something that's not true. Okay, so the, the Judaizers tried this, and Paul has some pretty strong words and condemns them for doing that. All right, and then in verse 4 to 6, we're going to see that this was something also that Paul himself tested. Paul tested trying to live this type of lifestyle. Listen to what Paul says, okay? In verse 4, it says, Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also, if anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Okay, so Paul's saying these Judaizers, they're, they're trying to say that there's, there's something about their, they're, they're, they're doing these things and that they're, they're convinced that by doing these things, they're impacting their standing before God, that they're in a better place with God because of what they're doing. And Paul's going to explain, I, I've tried this. Listen to my kind of portfolio of me trying to impress God. It says this, it says, 
in verse 5, he was circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin. So everything that it meant to be a Jew, Paul was, like, he was circumcised on the exact day. He was of the tribe of Benjamin. So of the two tribes that stayed faithful to David, he was part of that tribe and his, and his, and, and his descendants, okay? As to zeal, uh, sorry, He's a Hebrew of Hebrews as the law of Pharisees. So he was involved with the strictest form of following the Old Testament laws. And on top of the Old Testament laws, the Pharisees invented a whole bunch of more rules. And he was part of promoting and living that type of lifestyle. As to zeal, a persecutor of the church, to remember that, that Paul was involved or Saul was involved with stoning Stephen. He was so passionate about his religion and doing things to impress God that he was willing to go that far. And it says, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. And so Paul genuinely believed if you took the Old Testament and you compared that to Paul's life and you asked him, Paul, if you were to stand before God and use the Old Testament and the laws to say, what is your standing before God? He genuinely thought he was blameless. That means either he didn't break the law or any time he ever did, he always made a sacrifice for it. So Paul lived that life blamelessly, okay? And so, but what he says then in verse 7 is, but whatever gain I had, I count as loss for the sake of Christ. And so Paul did everything he could with every fiber of his being to try to impress God. And I want you to understand that, that the God that Paul was trying to impress was the God of the Bible. It was the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. Paul did with all of his energy, like every day, every moment of every day, everything he could to try to impress God so that, God, so that he could prove to God that he loved him. Like to, to the extent that we could never even imagine. Like I'm talking about going extreme amounts of days without eating, wearing uncomfortable clothes, dressing in a crazy way, memorizing and insane amounts of things, going to every religious thing you could ever think of. Paul did all of that. He, he was trying to impress God by the things that he did. And so Paul tested this. He tried the best he could to please God. And how does Paul express what this all accumulates to? If, Paul said that if I could take all of those things, I spent so much of my life trying to impress God by my actions. And so what does that value? What does that equal up to? And he says this in verse 7, but whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as, lo as loss because of the, of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. And so Paul explains if he could add up or put a price tag on all of his good works for years and years, it would equal a pile of garbage. And, and, and like he spent his whole life doing things for God, not for himself. He was generally trying to do them for God, but he realized he, was, he, he totally missed the mark. That that's not what God had ever intended, that God wasn't after him doing things to impress him. God was actually after something different. God was after his heart. And so as we hear these things, like, what does that look like for us today? What does it look like for, for me to live a life that's defined by trying to do things to impress God? And I, I just wanted to share this message with you, not because I have figured this all out, but because I think a, a huge majority of my life has been wasted trying to impress or prove to God that I love him. I spent so much of my Christian life worried about what, what can I do to prove that this decision that I made to place my faith in God was real. Because if I could do enough to show God that I love him, then I would know for sure that, that I believe in him. And, and maybe if I, if I could do enough things, if, if, I could, if I could serve enough in the church, if I could love him a much enough, maybe then I would do enough to prove that I was worth dying for, okay? But I, I want you to understand that that is so counter-gospel, it's insane. Because the good news of the gospel is this, is that while we were sinners and dead in our trespasses, even though we didn't love God, Colossians says, while we were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, it says he has now reconciled 
us in his flesh by his death in order to present us holy and blameless and above reproach before him. And so while we were sinners, even though we did nothing, even though we did nothing to deserve God's love, Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins. That, that's what the gospel is. So why do I think that I can do something to earn that? If by definition, it's about the fact that I can't do anything to have a right relationship with God, that's why Jesus Christ had to die. And so I don't know why I kind of do this in my own Christian life, but it's like I get that in terms of like salvation. And so what I mean is like I understood at some point in my life that I was a sinner and that Jesus died for me and I realized I needed him and that I could do nothing without him. I couldn't do anything to change my relationship with him but at some point in my Christian life, I, I, began to, I, be, I began to become convinced that if I did certain things, then God would love me more, and that, that God would bless me more, and that my life would look this way because I'm impressing God, and God's then pouring out these blessings on my life. But I just want to let you know that, that every other religion in the world, that's what it is. Like, every religion beside Christianity is what can I do to impress my God so that my God will love me and bless me? And it's, it's a work-based thing. There are these things that I do to, to impress God. And so um, I, I love, so, so what, are some, what, are some, what are some examples of what that can look like in the church today? Um, I'm going to give you a definition. I love how Matthew Henry kind of summarizes what those things look like, what it looks like to be self-righteous today. He says this, he says, confidence in the flesh is following carnal ordinances and outward performances. He says, confidence in the flesh is following carnal ordinances and outward performances. And this is one of those moments where it's really great to be a guest speaker, okay? Because I don't know how you guys do things at church, and if I step on toes, I, I kind of apologize, but I'm just going to share what doesn't matter to God, okay? And so hopefully it don't hurt anybody's feelings. So carnal ordinances, this is part of self-righteousness, are things that we do in church that the Bible never says we have to do, okay? Or that the Bible just generally doesn't care about. And so um, I'll give you an example of that, okay? Um, the Bible doesn't say you have to have prayer meeting on Wednesday night. I know, okay? That's like, it's earth-shattering and it's crazy. But the Bible does say it's good to get together and pray, right? But you can get together and pray wherever you want, you can get together and pray on a, a Wednesday night, that's fine, you, on, a, on a Tuesday night, and then it doesn't even have to be at night, it could be during the day. It doesn't have to be in the church. Like, God genuinely doesn't care what day of the week you go to prayer meeting or pray. If you're convinced that by going to prayer meeting you love God more, you're self-righteous. And that, that hurt. I'm not, I'm not like this pointing fingers. I'm just telling you. I, I was pretty convinced for a lot of my Christian life that the more time I was in church meant the more I loved God. And sometimes, I'm not pointing, I don't, I don't know any circumstances, okay? But sometimes we can assume that the most spiritual people in the room are the ones that get here first and leave last and attend everything, okay? But I just want to let you know that if you think that that means you love God, or if you think that that is going to change how much God loves you, you're self-righteous, Okay, additionally, okay, this is another thing that God doesn't care about. God does not care about what worship songs you sing on a Sunday morning in terms of style of music. He, he doesn't care. You can have a piano or an organ or drums or a trumpet or a tambourine. Okay, that's extreme, I know. But, but it, it, like literally, God doesn't care what type of worship you, you, you have in terms of the style of music. It doesn't matter to him. It, there's nowhere, I can't find in the Bible anywhere because most instruments didn't exist. They literally had instruments and they used them. That, that's what happened, okay? And so God doesn't, like, so I need to realize that I, I don't need to go to a church that just plays music that I like because it, it's not about the music. It's about the words. It's about worshiping God. I, if I think that because I like a certain style of music more or a certain style of worship more, that I love God more than somebody else, I'm, I'm self-righteous, okay? And so that, that, the list goes on and on. I mean, another thing is like this is an, uh, we were talking about communion, which isn't going to happen next week, just so everybody knows, um, I think, unless it does. But um, like you don't have to drink communion out of a little cup. Like we, we do that in church, but it doesn't have to be in a little cup. And it doesn't have to be the first Sunday of every month. 
In fact, it could be more frequently than that. It doesn't even, you could do that in your house, okay? It doesn't have to be a cracker. You know, there's these things in church that we think things have to be this way or otherwise we're not glorifying God. The doing things for the sake of doing things does not impress God. And Paul says, if you could take all the things, I did all that I could to try to impress God in all those things. I went to every Wednesday night prayer meeting. I, I drank communion every single Sunday. I never missed it once. I got like an attendance badge for Sunday school when I was in, when I was in Sunday school. Like I, and Paul, that's not, Paul says all that equals nothing. It has no impact on how much God loves me because God loved me when I didn't deserve it. That's what it's all about. And so I hope you can kind of understand that. I might sound a little bit repetitive, but I just want to say that I, like, I don't, specifically, I would just say for, for young people, if, if, if you think that you need to do something to show God that you love him, you, you need to understand that he loves you anyways. And, and I need to tell you that because if you think that you can do things to, to show that you love God, this is what's going to happen, is you're going to realize you're not perfect. And you're, you're going to mess up. And you're going to struggle with things, and you're going to make mistakes. Because I, I was really sure for a lot of my life that God loved me more the less I made mistakes. That, that, that if, if I could be like this perfect Christian person, then, I, then, then God would really, really love me then and do great things in and through my life. And, and I realized that this is something that I realized is that there's someone that always seems to let me down in my life, and it's not my wife, okay? It's, it's me. Uh, if I had to say the person who's let me down most in this life, it's, it's me. I, I always have these, like, I like, think of these things I'm going to do, and I'm, I'm not going to fall for that sin again. I'm not, I'm not going to do that thing or think about that thing or be in this place. And then I find myself there again, and I'm like, what What happened? Like, how, how did I end up here? Like, I, I, I told God on Sunday that I love him, yet I'm thinking about these things I shouldn't be thinking about. Do I, do I even love God? Does God even love me? How could God ever love someone like me? I don't know if you've ever been there before, but I get there all the time. And then you remind myself that that's when God loved me. And in those moments, when I, when I didn't deserve it, that's when Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sins because I didn't deserve it. And so we need to understand that if we could take all of those things and put them on a pedestal and say, what do my good works equal for the sake of just doing things to prove that God, that I, that I love God or that I, would, that I think that is going to change my relationship with God? Well, that, that amounts to nothing. It's useless. And Paul says, I tried that to the, 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 the most you could ever attempt to do that. And I realized that compared to what God actually has for our lives, that that is trash. So what's true then? So we've talked about how the, the Judaizers tried this, that Paul tested it, and that by comparison is trash. So what's true? All right, in verse 9 it says this, and be found, I think this is the key verse of this whole passage, by the way. And be found in him, so in Christ, not having righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ Jesus, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. And so you can have a right standing before God. You can stand before God holy and blameless, not because of anything you've done, but because of what Christ did through faith. There's literally nothing you do in the process of becoming saved that involves you. It's literally, literally, it's God sent his son to die on the cross for our sins, and it's, it's by faith, which is by definition, not by works, okay? And so that's, I just need to remind you that that's what this relationship with God is all about. It's not about our righteousness. It's about Christ's righteousness. And so the sooner we can understand that this life is just us living through what Christ did for us, the, the more enjoyable the Christian life truly is going to be. And so this thinking completely transformed Paul's life. Paul, I, I mean, you think of who Saul was and who Paul became. There was a, a major shift in his life because of what God did in and through his life. And it was him realizing that there was nothing he could do to impress God. And so I want to encourage you with whatever is going on in your life, just to try to understand that, that you don't need to, to work or to do things to have a right relationship 
with God. And so what, what can this life actually look like or, or what should this be about? Um, Paul's going to explain that, what a transformed life looks like. In verse 10, it says this. It says, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share in his suffering, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. So Paul had this transformation in his thinking, and Paul realized it's not about doing things for God, it's about knowing God. And that, that's like, when I, when I started to, I still have a lot to learn, say, but when I understood that the Christian life isn't about me trying to do good things, that I just get to enjoy getting to know God, it was like, I was like, why did nobody tell me this, this sooner? Like, I, you mean all those times I, I thought that like God didn't love me because I did something wrong, I need to realize that this life isn't about me trying to impress God, it's about me getting to know God? And so listen to the difference that that makes, okay? So there's nothing wrong with going to a prayer meeting on Wednesday or Tuesday night or whenever it is. There's two very different ways you can attend a prayer meeting. One way is I need to go to a prayer meeting because if I don't, I'm not, I'm kind of showing that I don't really love God. And like, what is Jimmy going to think? Because normally I come to prayer meeting and I'm not coming this week. So Jimmy's probably going to think my relationship with God's maybe not going that great this week. And maybe the deacons are going to find out and someone's going to call me or worst off, like Pastor Josh might find out I've been skipping prayer meeting and he might like ask if I'm okay. Like, like, like that, what's going to happen if that happens? And it's like, so I got to go. I, I got to go to, to, to prove to everybody that I love God. That's why I'm going. That's one way to attend prayer meeting. And when you miss it, you feel horrible because you didn't prove that you love God. So do you love God? Okay, that, that's one way to live. The other way to live is there's prayer meeting going on tonight. It's on a Wednesday night. There's nothing wrong with it being on Wednesday night. I'm excited to go to prayer meeting because at prayer meeting, I get to know more about the God who sent his son to die on the cross for my sins. I, I get to pray to a God that doesn't just not exist and only hear me if I'm doing everything correctly, but that loves me anyways and hears my petitions and wants what's best for me and loves my family and died for a world and we live in a world that needs him more than anything else anyone can ever understand. And I get to go and pray to him and know him more through being at prayer meeting. Same meeting, okay? I spent, I can't even tell you how much of my life I spent doing this and the Christian, that Christian life, I'm just going to be transparent, it's, it sucks. I don't even know how else to put it. It's, it's miserable. It's, it's, it's full of anxiety and full of ups and downs and, and, and wondering, like, how does God feel about me? Or when I die, am I actually going to go to heaven because I don't feel like I deserve it? Versus I get to spend a life serving a God that I don't deserve to even know. And he'll, even though I didn't deserve it, died on the cross for my sins and who I get to spend the eternity with, and who right now is preparing a place for me, and who loves me, and who would do anything for me, and you're, you're telling me that he knows my name, he, 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 he loves me, he, he, he cares about me, he, he, all these different things. I get to know him a little bit more? That, that, that's a, that, when, I, when I understood that, I was like, Sign me up for that. I, I get, you're telling me the God that created everything and that holds the universe together and they've just, I mean, I don't know if you follow NASA stuff, but they just like started taking pictures with a new telescope. And if you haven't seen it, you need to because understanding we serve a God who created a universe that thousands of years later, we finally have the technology to take pictures of, to look at, to be like, whoa, God, right? That, like, there's no way that stuff that we should never ever be able to see except for technology looks that beautiful other than the fact that someone created it to point us back to him and i get to to know him on a personal level and that that same god lives in me and died for me like you understand like what that christian life looks like and so i just want to encourage you that that that's what this life is all about God wants you to, to know him more. And the unbelievable thing is the more you get to know him, the more you start to live like him. And so that battle of like trying to not sin and, and fall in different ways, the, the more you know him and love him, the more you realize, I, I, are you kidding me? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick me over my, my God? I still do that. But yet the, the more you grow, you realize, I, I'm the more I know God, the more, the less attractive sin seems to be. And, and the more I realize, like, why would I ever choose me over God? And, 
and you understand, and, and then that's what fuels our growth, and that's what fuels our relationship, and it's so much more encouraging, and it's a completely different type of life than what Paul's saying these people were trying to do. And so I wanted to bring that to you to help you realize that that's the type of life that we're meant to live. And I also want to say that if that's, so if that's what our Christian life looked like, and that's how we explain the gospel to people, and we help them realize that church isn't about or isn't a place full of self-righteous people who get together on a Sunday morning and dress the nicest and put their biggest smile on and their kids behave perfectly, right? It's like, you're like you come in, you're like, I can't be like these people. They got it all together, okay? If, that's what, if, if we were meant to be this group of self-righteous people, no one would want to be part of our group other than us, okay? And, but if this is what the Christian life looks like, if it's like, hey, um, I'm like a dad, and I had churches tomorrow, and my kids didn't really sleep that well last night, and one of them threw up on me, and I like probably altogether got like two hours of sleep, and then like work was hard this week, and me and my wife are having like a, it's not, things aren't great at the moment, and I'm struggling, but I'm here. And, and I, I don't have the answers to everything, and, and I'm broken, but I, I'm looking forward to getting to know God more, right? And, and, and I might not have it all figured out. And could you imagine you're having a conversation at church with somebody, and they're like, I had a hard week. Like, my kids were up all night, and you're like, what? And you're here? Because that was what my week looked like. And isn't it encouraging that in the middle of how hard that week was, we can find some hope in knowing that the that God has a purpose for everything that's going on in our lives, that God wants us to know him more. And aren't you excited to be here this morning to get to know God just a little bit more? And maybe you're falling asleep or whatever, but you're here because you want to know him more, okay? Versus like, uh, I got to go to church again today. Me and the wife aren't doing so good and, and I'm miserable. And if I don't go, then I'm, I don't even know anymore. And and I, I better pretend, you know, right before we pull into the church, I got to let the kids know, um, hey, this was less than a holy church ride, okay? And you need to stop it because we're going into church, and if you're not perfect, people are going to know we're not perfect, and that's going to mess everyone's, like, what, that, that, it's like, that's not what it's all about. So I just want to say that it, as believers, the last thing we should be known as is self-righteous because that's, that's the exact opposite of the gospel, Self-righteousness does not save you. If you think you can do things to have a right standing before God, that is not what the gospel is all about. If you believe that the gospel is all about God dying on your behalf because you are sinful and broken and can't do it on your own, and that every morning, even though you're not perfect, you get to experience his grace and his mercy in your life, and that the days that you don't feel like going on or giving it another breath or you just feel like giving up, that there's some sort of hope left because you serve a God and he has it all figured out even though we aren't okay with it sometimes. Like, that's, that's really what this Christian life's about because if I'm being genuine, okay, um, I understand and I don't know what you guys are going through or what's happening in your lives, um, but um, there's times we can come to church and we can, we can hear these things and, and these are important biblical truths and we can understand that God's at work and that he has a plan and a purpose, but there's just like times that even in the middle of all these things and the excitement of getting to know God, you're just like not okay with, God, with what God's allowing in your life right now. And so um, I, I'll just say there's times in my life that happen more frequently than I like to admit, probably, where I'm like, God, okay, I, I love you. Right now it's hard, and I'm actually not okay with what you're doing in my life, um, but I, I know you have a purpose and, and a plan, and I know that you love me, and I know that as I get to know you more, it's going to maybe make more sense, but it might not, all, it might not ever make sense. And, and I'm looking forward to the day that I meet you, and we get to work through this, and I understand what you were doing, and in the middle of all that, I'm going to be stuck with this thing that my relationship with you is all about anyways, is I'm just going to have to have faith. And I had, to have, I had to have faith in order to believe that you sent Jesus to die on the cross for my sin. And I'm struggling with the fact that my brother passed away or that my sister's sick or that, or that whatever. And I'm just going to today by faith trust in you again, not for salvation, but because you are the God of the universe. And I love knowing you more, and I just pray, God, that you'd give me the strength to get through another day. That, that's what a lot of my days look like. 
right? And, and that's, that's, that's what pe- people need to understand. You know, when, when, you, when, you're working, when you're going through something very difficult in this life and you're living a self-righteous life pretending like everything's okay, people are just convinced like that person's made of stone because they're going through something hard and they're pretending like it's okay and I, that's impossible. And that, that's what can happen is as Christians, we pretend that we have it all together. But when we're blunt and we're honest and we're like, God, I'm, example in my life, Okay, God decided to allow my oldest son to have Down syndrome. Okay, I love him beyond any of, like, I love him so much, and I love so many days with him, but there's days where I just have to break down and cry because I'm like, God, this isn't fair. Like, and I understand, and I understand there's, I understand the theological truths behind that, but he's, like, upset, and he, he can't express himself, and today's really hard, God, and I, I'm actually not okay with this but I, I trust you. And then you come in contact with somebody else who's feeling like giving up on life, which if you didn't notice, a lot of people are at that point. And you're saying, I'm having a hard time with life right now, um, but I have this hope and I have this God and I, and I love him and, and I let him down sometimes, but he shows me grace and mercy and I get to serve him and know him more. And he's what helps me get through today, even though it's hard. The, the world can relate to that. And the world needs to hear that. So I would just encourage you in our Christian life, let's not pretend like we have it all together. Let's stop trying to impress God because we think if we do good things, he's going to look at us differently. He, he's not. He, he loves us. He died for us. He saved us. And now we get to spend the rest of our lives getting to know him. And as we get to know him, the amount of times we're going to be able to serve and live like him is going to blow your mind. So I just encourage you with whatever's going on in your life, um, you don't have to pretend like it's all okay. Get excited about knowing God because that's what eternity is going to be about. We're literally going to spend eternity getting to know this God. If you think when you get to heaven, it's going to be like this, this flashlight comes on and you understand everything, like that would make heaven exciting for like five seconds, okay? But we're going to spend all of eternity getting to know this God more and it's going to be incredible. And praise God that we have opportunities like church, in prayer meeting, and relationship with other believers where we get to continue to do that while we're here and do it for the reason of just knowing him more. And if you have to miss because something's going on, it's it's okay, all right? It's okay. God's not gonna change how God feels about you. It's just life. Continue to find ways to know him more um, for his honor and for his glory. All right, so I wanna encourage you with that this morning. Um, I'll just pray for you as a church and um, yeah, let me pray. Dear God, I thank you so much for this day, Lord. God, I thank you for the good news of the gospel. Lord, I thank you that you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for our sins, even though we didn't deserve it. And God, I pray um, that you would just forgive uh, me, Lord, for the times where I've tried to do things to impress you, or where I've pretended, Lord, like um, everything's okay in my self-righteous attitude. And God, I pray that you would just help us to be okay to be real and open and broken people to a world that desperately needs you. And God, um, I I pray that we'd also not only be people that just open our Bibles, but people that share the good news of that gospel and what the word says with the world around us. In your precious and holy name I pray, amen. Amen. I invite you to stand with us as we sing in closing the stand. But I prefer this 
you are dismissed. I trust you'll have a good time of fellowship. Don't rush out. If you have somebody to talk to, go ahead and talk to them. Hope you have a blessed Sunday and a blessed week.